Cool. So, um, Satesh, please um, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Hey, um, so uh, uh, for for me, at least at, from a career perspective, uh, I started my career about 16 years back. So it's been a long, long time, um, mainly uh, so mainly around. Uh, so I started my career as started my career as tester for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was mainly around, I uh, started, started working in a company called Symantec. Uh, everyone knows that, not an antivirus. Uh, I stayed there for five to seven years. And then I moved to uh, a bank called Barclays, again, a known brand. Uh, and it was, it was quite a great experience working in both sectors, but banking is more challenging uh, in terms of you have to get your quality right. Um, and not that semantic wasn't but banking has a different kind of challenge which i really enjoyed and then i carried forward in the other companies uh, which was more of again banking more of uh, uh, around investment banking so and uh, uh, loans and uh, finance around that domain so that was more of that kind of domain and uh, uh, my passion for uh, i have no formal training uh, just to be very honest I don't have any formal training on automation. It's just out of my interest when I first started like 16 years back. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, it just grew. I just I love I love automation in general. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it just grew in building frameworks in uh, using uh, everyone is aware of QTP. We started with QTP and all that UI based tools. Then it graduated to Selenium. Then it's gone gone to now AI based tools. So it has obviously progressed. and. I always try to catch up uh, or try to be in line with the latest uh, uh, latest automation uh, uh, tools. Uh, that's my passion and that's always my passion. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, mainly, uh, so in, in the, to sum up the career from a quality perspective is mainly around banking as a domain. Uh, obviously, AgriDigital is uh, uh, a new and interesting uh, uh, domain as well uh, because you have, uh, uh, yeah, do you mind old... telling us a bit about sure, about what sure. AgriDigital does? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, I'll I'll start my start my uh, uh, st start uh, mentioning about AgriDigital in terms of we have an age old problem of like agriculture is a quite a quite a niche domain, but we have an age old problem and we are trying to solve it with the new age technology. Uh, when I say that, what it means basically is we're trying to have a cloud base. We are a rather a cloud base. Uh, platform uh, where we can have commodity management for farmers, where they can transparently uh, deal with grains, they can uh, sell their grains. Uh, it's we are we are definitely uh, integrating with blockchain uh, going forward as well. Um, so it's it's going to be it's quite exciting to be honest. I've been here for almost two years now. Uh, July been mm -hmm. I'll be completing two years, but it's been quite exciting because you get to learn a lot of things in agriculture, which. Uh, my my domain is not agriculture per se, as you can see, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was definitely because I've been uh, I, there have been a couple of visits to the farm. They actually, so AgriDigital encourages people to go to the farm and actually see the customer in action, mm. and that has actually helped to know uh, how how the agriculture in general is operated and using and seeing our application in action was quite exciting. So. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we are we are based out of Sydney, um, and uh, that's our that's our headquarters. Uh, and we are uh, uh, obviously in Orange as well uh, in in NSW, uh, and we are expanding. So uh, we we also have customers in so we have customers in Australia, we have customers in US. So US is our uh, major uh, customer mm -hmm. base as well, uh, and we are expanding to Canada as well. So there has been a quite a quite exciting progression in that sense because we started with a small set of customers in Australia because uh, as you know agriculture is a tough domain to get to but I think mm. we have uh, kind of solved that problem uh, which farmers usually have about selling grains about having a technology to help them um, so I think we started with that now we are progressing to having a great customer base in the US and obviously going forward we'll hit Canada as well so it's quite exciting in that sense. How big is the um, team you generally work with there? Um, the total total size of the team is uh, 
about 40, 40, 50 people. Uh, that's including operations and including uh, uh, developer development team, testers and everything. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's about 40, 50 people. Mm, that's uh, that's a nice manageable size. You can actually know yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As opposed to working for a, a giant corporate like Barclays Bank or something like that. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, I felt I felt the difference for sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, because uh, uh, in agri digital, I can just uh, if I want to find out the bigger picture, I can obviously talk to the CEO directly. It's as transparent as that. So it it is a different culture because you get to learn a lot about mm. uh, about the end to end flow uh, which is uh, which is might not be possible uh, in companies like barclays or in semantic you, you never you you might not get the whole picture uh, yeah in, yeah you yeah, rarely get the whole picture exactly but in agri digital it's not the case we are absolutely transparent to each other and we mm. uh, yeah we the culture is pretty good how sense. did you uh, how did you get your first job in testing um first so I have to. It's it's quite a quite a long back, long back <laughs> yeah. but I'll I'll try to I'll try to remember. So the first job for testing was uh, through a friend. Uh, actually, uh, when I graduated, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it it was uh, mainly through a friend who said, I just yeah, I just come for the interview and just see how it goes. I had no knowledge of testing. I just I have no formal mm. training of automation. Mm. I just went for this uh, for the job. Uh, and when I first started off, uh, like the first month was, I didn't know what was happening, to be honest. Uh, I don't know what quality meant. Um, but slowly, and when I when I got to know what quality is, what product cycle is, and every all that uh, all that jargons, um, yep. we then I got got interested in in the domain of quality, um, and I never left. I never looked back. Yeah. Well, so yeah. Uh, while we're on the topic of quality, what does quality mean to you? Um, quality, quality. I would say, uh, for me, quality is not. Let me let me put it this way. Quality for me, at least, is looking to avoid issues rather than finding issues. If that makes sense, it's all about uh, finding issues at the at the upstream level or at the start of the product life cycle instead of finding issues at the end. Quality is not just sitting at the testing end or at the latter end of the project. That's not what quality is. And I mm. think uh, the, the the world has evolved in that sense because we are, we need to start looking at quality in at the upstream level to avoid issues, to avoid yeah. uh, communication. So to get that, that, that feedback on the, yes, to, absolutely. to help us ask that, answer that question, are we yeah. building the right thing for our customers? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, just to give an example, uh, for in agri-digital, uh, we, we encourage, uh, 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 our product analysts to talk to customers to do the customer validation instead of just building building products building features we we usually don't do that we want to ensure we understand the customer we go to the field go to the site and ensure that we get all the information and then look at building a feature or building a, a particular product uh, so yeah i think quality is starts from there um, and uh, and secondly quality for me is uh, not as a, it ties back to the first point, but it's not sitting in a box. It has to be overlapped. As as the, it it may sound a little cliche, but it's quality is everyone's responsibility, right? I mean, it's not mm -hmm. just lies with testers. It does not lie with just uh, developers. It's everyone should contribute there. Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah. If once once we break that barrier, when we say quality, it does not sit in a box, then we can probably have uh, more uh, better quality because. Uh, in, in, in the companies previously, which I worked, quality is obviously looked at at the later end of the project when everything is done and you want to test it out with some bunch of testers who uh, who just create test cases and uh, try to execute them and just pro provide a nice report. Uh, yeah, I think that that's where uh, the projects go wrong in terms of quality, because I think uh, for uh, for quality to start, it has to be customer driven. It has to be uh, at at upstream level at the start of the product life cycle. All that matters. It might mm -hmm. it may sound oh it may sound a little bookish, but it is not because in agri digital, for example, uh, uh, it is it is quite it is implemented successfully because we have uh, last latter part of last year we had implemented that kind of a model where we wanted to uh, first 
have the quality in the forefront instead of looking at uh, at at the end. Mm -hmm. So, has there in terms of uh, quality and the the recent pandemic and everyone working from home, have you seen any challenges recently that impact uh, trying to get that uh, quality feedback earlier on in the cycle? Um, I mean, when we started off uh, with this uh, uh, working from home arrangement as a team, uh, our part of our part of my team was already already working remotely. So we have a few guys in Manila as well. So it was the remote thing was already there. Mm -hmm. um, so we were used to that kind of communication. So it has not impacted much to start off with when everyone was working from home. It's it's slightly impacted in terms of getting the feedback early. Uh, getting to know the issues early, but now that we have um, proactively had some measures taken in terms of uh, everyone gives an update at the end of the day or the usual stuff of getting more feedbacks early, I think it it has really improved, uh, and uh, I, I don't think we have uh, found any issues now. And and it and on a positive note, what has happened is it has now uh, it has now made us realize that we can all work from home. Uh, at some point because remote working would be uh, the norm going forward as well because a lot of people think oh coming to office working in office environment helps but this kind of situation has actually helped us to know that remote working also can work if the situation demands so yeah it has been a positive in that sense mm. yeah i was a bit reluctant with the whole work from home stuff initially yeah, yeah. Uh, and um uh, i guess a little bit of context for for our stream as i work for combank so big giant bank uh, here. Uh, and uh, the biggest challenge we faced was our technology wasn't up to speed enough to support 55,000 employees doing remote work all at once. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, it's yeah. a lot easier to get around some of those challenges yeah. if you've got a smaller team. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. So the, the, the next question I had in the conversation um, so, also given the context of the remote working situation, um, how do you help support a, a learning mindset or a community of practice if you're trying to upskill in automation skills? Right. I think uh, uh, what what we have done is uh, uh, in terms of uh, upskilling the team and obviously, as you mentioned, the remote working as well, uh, we have a model where uh, the, uh, there is no... Uh, when you say upskilling for a for a tester is uh, just not learning automation. It's all about also understanding the product, understanding uh, the the end to end flow of the product. You need to be an expert as such. So uh, what we usually do is uh, in in that in that sense we have reviews in terms of having uh, business analyzing the sorry business reviewing the uh, the scenarios the end to end flows. Uh, from a quality perspective, and also uh, from automation perspective, we have uh, we have a model where uh, the the story itself, when I say story, we have agile. So the story itself has uh, uh, automation built in. When I say automation built in, it's a part of a part of the task. It's part of the work. We don't part consider of the definition of done. Part, part of definition of done. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think. Uh, so that that has become so we don't have something like a manual tester automation tester we are too small to have such kind of walls <laughs> between uh, so uh, everyone has to do everyone has to do it to their bit so the automation um, uh, is spread across uh, so it's ui automation mobile automation you call it uh, uh, api automation everything is uh, built in uh, into that story and uh, the tester has to pick it up uh, there is no other option because uh, uh, because we have to ensure that, uh, and it's it's all about definition of done, and we don't have formal trainings. We do we we encourage them to do training. That's part of their goals as well. But uh, if if you do if you tell them to do this task rather to ask them to do this task, it would be easier for them to learn, and we're all ready to help in terms of getting their upskill with respect to automation. Mm. Uh, so we try to encourage them uh, to learn uh, automation on the go right as part of their job and not a separate training which sometimes get lost uh, because you don't mm. don't you may may not apply that training into the job so we want to ensure it's part of the job rather than a training which sits in silo 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I found that hands-on training is the, the yeah. best way to yeah. uh, make lessons learned more concrete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so absolutely. there, I guess there is that move, uh, move in the industry I've seen towards more having more technical testers who, yeah. who can contribute code, who know their way around GitHub. Um, they don't yeah. necessarily have to be full software engineers, but having that, having that software engineering mindset seems to be um, a trend towards the market. Absolutely. I think I, I call it, uh, I don't know if that's a term, but uh, it's a full stack. We have a full stack developer. Why don't we have a full stack tester? Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, that's uh, what I have on on, on one of my uh, profiles is I'll make full stack testing a thing. Exactly. exactly. I think absolutely. I think that uh, the market is going that way because uh, we, we can't have, uh, I mean, manual tester has its own value. There's uh, absolutely, but We'll have uh, the skill sets the market needs now is, as you said, the the code level, the the GitHub knowledge, the the automation knowledge, basic knowledge uh, to start off with. But yeah, that's that's a trend in the market right now. Mm, yeah, and I have yeah. spoken to some people who have found it um, challenging to upskill in those particular areas when they haven't had a team or the support structure um, to be able to learn that stuff on the job, um, and there's a bit of a trend with testers who feel like they're being left behind because they're not picking up these skills but then it's also not necessarily everyone's uh cup of tea it's uh yeah. some people prefer not to have those technical skills yeah um yeah. so what other paths can uh people uh move towards i guess in the in the testing space yeah i think uh, i see there are two to three paths paths that, that can move to uh first is obviously they can be a good technical tester uh, in terms of having more, uh, getting closer to the code uh, in terms of that. Uh, that's one thing which they can move to. Uh, again, with that path, it, we have to keep that in mind that the manual testing should not uh, should not be forgotten <laughs> because that's also important. Uh, second path is, uh, as you said, some people are just not just not into it in terms of learning automation or having a technical mindset, which is fine, which is which I get. So they can move to a product analyst role or a business analyst role, which we have, uh, which we have kind of done in our uh, in Agri Digital. So, uh, so yeah, I think. Uh, and the third part can be probably uh, because testers as such are good at organizing skill, organization skills, and good at communication, good at coordination, because that's part of their job. Uh, so they can be also in good in being a scrum master or also a good project manager for that matter. I, I just feel that uh, if uh, if we have good uh, project managers and with a quality mindset that would really help the product. Mm. Uh, so I think that the three parts I can think of which can uh, testers can go into. Uh, I, I think we've briefly mentioned um, agile practices. Has there ever been any ceremony that you've tried and has not worked for your team? I think w one of the ceremonies uh, uh, we have tried uh, is uh, retros quite a lot. I mean, retros are important. Uh, it's it's not like it didn't work. Uh, it's just that uh, we didn't have a model at that point. We were, uh, uh, we were, we didn't have a model in terms of having that feedback in terms mm. of retros. Retros is like people getting together and talking about uh, what didn't work and what did work. Yeah, yeah, but and then think, creating a small action item that you can small improve. Action item. Correct, small action item we can improve. But I think that that model uh, was not uh, implemented end to end in terms of uh, getting that feedback and getting that actions done. Mm. So I think uh, we are we are still improving on that. Uh, I won't say it didn't work. It's just that we need to improve it further. Yeah, yeah. I've I found with some of the teams I've worked in, when it comes to the retrospective, uh, more people use the opportunity to whinge and complain uh, yeah. <laughs> about their yeah. their way of work, but they yeah. don't want to uh, they don't want to implement a small change. Absolutely, I think that's that's uh, that's where uh, the retros are important, but we, it has to be structured. It has to be uh, uh, actionable. That that's mm. that's where it adds value. Um, so, uh, looking forward, then, where are you hoping your career takes you? Or what do you think is um, happening in the industry at the moment? Um, I think uh, in the industry, as uh, the quality aspect of things in terms of testing roles, uh, as you pointed out early, uh, we the, 
it is getting to a point where we need a full stack tester uh, from a from a market point of view uh, and uh, since my my role is more of management but i don't leave hands on i love hands on uh, mm. coding uh, whenever i get a chance uh, that's my passion as i mentioned before uh, so um, i don't want to leave that as uh, for sure but my my inclination is into product management uh, as well uh, because uh, I, again everything has needs quality i think product management is not an exception so my my career path is obviously towards project management product management uh, and uh, delivering roadmap for products what what goes into a good roadmap then uh, so yeah there are two three things which uh, in our in our uh, in in our company what we keep in mind when we have a have a roadmap discussion uh, which gets tricky because everyone has opinions um, uh, and the first thing is uh, mainly we have to understand uh, customer comes first uh, for product roadmap it's all about having that customer mindset uh, and secondly what is important is uh, ensuring that we reduce waste i think that's where we kind of need to improve uh, in terms of uh, ensuring we build the product in logical in uh, logical manner what happens is we uh, and that that is see, i've seen in previous companies we build a build a part of a part of a feature and we don't we don't think end to end and then it fails the product roadmap fails in terms of meeting the timelines because we didn't think about the end to end picture so product roadmap uh, for uh, the most important thing for product roadmap is as i said customer validation or uh, having customer mindset and secondly uh, is most important is to ensure that we improve efficiency in terms of building a feature uh, and uh, it's not about i mean i talk about feature but in my opinion feature is just not sufficient nowadays it's all about customer user experience it's all about uh, customer delight as well so uh, it's it's a mix of everything uh, we we give equal importance to uh, building a feature as well as having a good customer uh, user experience rather so uh, yeah i think uh, the roadmap needs to include that as well to ensure that mm. we have uh, we have that mindset cool um, so in terms of a uh, feature and reducing waste, do you have a feature story that uh, uh, that comes to mind where uh, it you had some waste uh, and yeah, it wasn't yeah. as well planned out as you thought it would be? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, it's it's a ongoing uh, it's ongoing uh, thing, ongoing for improvement thing which happens. So uh, what? I mean, there, there are stories which we kind of uh, developed and released in production and uh, we didn't think it through in terms of end to end and we had to go back and uh, ensure that the feature is built in, in the logical and sequential manner and then release again in production. That has happened. But I think uh, uh, what has changed now and probably this start of this year is we've ensured that since quality, as I said, coming back to quality, uh, we've ensured that we think think through all the impact areas for a story and then we uh, release the story to development for like building the feature or building the uh, product we don't release it to the development unless we ensure that the impact areas are definitely reviewed by business by product analysts by testers everyone and then we release it to the development for building feature so that this kind of wastage is not uh, not frequent what type of uh, tools can you use in that environment to help support? Um, so I'm I'm more thinking along the lines of being able to release internally to dev and product owners. You need usually some sort of continuous integration or delivery type of model. Uh, what type of tools are you using to help support that that feedback at that level? Uh, so I think uh, for a project management perspective, we use Jira uh, quite a lot, uh, and we have. Uh, uh, next gen projects in Jira, uh, so which is the latest one, latest and greatest mm. one for Jira. Uh, we use that for tracking our roadmap uh, and ensuring we get feedbacks on the Jira. We uh, the whole the whole team, when I say the whole team, uh, even the product analyst, uh, business uh, testers, development has to look at the Jira, has to look at the roadmap uh, to ensure that uh, it's not uh, it's not sitting in silo, and uh, we uh, we ensure the review process 
from a business, from a tester's point of view, is tracked in Jira itself, uh, and the comments and everything is tracked in Jira and does not uh, like gets uh, does not get uh, lost in translation. Uh, it's documented, it's there, and then we move into the development boards. So we have agile and Kanban met Kanban teams as well. So we have like a product roadmap, which is like a like a, a master backlog, and then we ensure the quality and everything is maintained the review is done and then we move it to the the development kanban boards for uh, for the uh, feature development or for the product development mm. yeah i think uh, jira has got some um if you're using github as source control um you can generally integrate with branches and yeah. Yeah. depending on the continuous integration setup as well you can yeah. you can integrate a whole bunch of uh, things into into Jira. I I th yeah. think it's a really powerful tool these days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, since you talked about uh, uh, continuous integration uh, and continuous de deployment, we have that model as well. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, having we we use AWS uh, for our okay. infrastructure, so we have uh, uh, integration and the the automation that we have we have split it up into three parts: mobile, uh, web, and uh, API testing as well as unit testing. Uh, so it runs every, whenever there is a code check-in, I mean, as a typical model, uh, it runs uh, all this test and gives us early feedback, which is great. I think we have found it very, very useful. Uh, so uh, just to touch base on that, uh, what happens usually is we build a lot of frameworks and I've been in that, in that situation, what happened? We in the previous company has to build frameworks, all the snazzy and nice reports and everything. and we forget two things, uh, which I want to touch base. Two basic things. Uh, first is uh, uh, the test coverage. The what? What needs to be automated? We absolutely forget it. Mm. Uh, we are so so tied up as automation testers in uh, ensuring it it is reusable. It produces nice reports. We forget what test coverage is, uh, and the test coverage uh, is so important. It's all about that, right? You might well as uh, hard code. Uh, like uh, use a hard code script for automation, uh, but your test coverage is not, if the test coverage is good, it will show you results and that's important. Uh, and uh, second thing is uh, for automation is, it's not about, uh, it's not about uh, how you do it. Uh, it's uh, absolutely, I understand that tools are there to help us, but it's all about what you need to automate and where you need to run it. I think where is also important. When I say where it should not, ideally uh, run the automation manually like even if it's a click of a button it should not be done and that's a practice that we need to follow because that's that's what we do in uh, agri digital as well we don't uh, we don't want people to run it manually even if it's a job we don't want to because we want to ensure that the automation pipelines and the automation cicd pipelines take care of it mm. um, so i think that's one thing which uh, we have changed uh, at agri digital mm. yep. yeah um, yeah, I've noticed you've uh, been uh, blogging or you've maintained a blog for, for a little yeah. while. I think the most yeah. recent blog post was on uh, machine learning algorithms and resources. Uh, yeah. Do you see this as a skill and demand for testers at the moment? Yes, I think, uh, yes, it is. It is absolutely, uh, 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 it is coming up. I won't say uh, it has uh, absolutely established itself. It is coming up in terms of uh, learning AI. Uh, and uh, AI is just not about automation or automation frameworks. It can be also used to generate uh, intelligent test cases for you if it's used properly. Uh, I think one thing which uh, testers or anyone needs to do is understand the basics of AI. Uh, there are a lot of courses online um, and uh, that can be used just to understand the basic and then see how it can be fitted in, in your day-to-day -day activity. Uh, because a lot of, uh, lot of uh, blogs, I see a lot of uh, companies claim to be AI and they might be, but I think the, use, the usage of AI is questionable because AI is not a easy thing to learn or implement. Mm. Uh, and it needs a lot of a lot of dedication in terms of uh, uh, in terms of understanding the depth of it. Uh, so I think getting to know the basics is important, and then you start to see if how it can be fitted in your day-to-day -day activity. Start with small, start with simple things, yeah, and then build on that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of marketing hype around um, 
um, how to use AI or AI is going to make testers jobs redundant. Um, I mean, like every, I think every six months there's a new uh, article saying testers roles are dead. <laughs> Long live I, I automation. <laughs> I think that, that was the, you're right. I think that was the way when the automation came in as well, the seleniums and yeah. the QTPs, everything came in and people said, oh man, jobs, jobs are going to go off. I think it's not, it's not. And AI is just to help. Uh, there is there's a human intelligence that is that we get paid for and that cannot uh, that cannot be uh, forgotten or underrated uh, i think uh, uh, ai will just help and i'm i'm sure uh, manual testing and uh, testing in general is there here to stay so how do you think or how do you imagine testers will be able to use uh, ai in in future roles um, I think first uh, first thing which I foresee is uh, uh, in terms of AI, uh, uh, have some tools, there are some APIs in uh, online. They can use it to uh, generate test cases. Uh, also, there are tools, uh, uh, there are some, if you want to learn about automation and if you uh, want to see more, uh, uh, more, more, there are tools, which, there are a lot of AI tools nowadays. Uh, in basically around UI, uh, things like uh, test.ai, uh, you can have a look. Uh, there is one called Mabel, uh, which is again an AI-based tool, uh, which which can, like, if you want to get uh, get started in terms of having AI, AI in action, seeing AI in action, then that's, that kind of tools really help to uh, get started. So they're pretty easy to uh, use as well. I've used uh, one of them and it's pretty easy to use. Um, and you can use them for your uh, test, uh, which you can uh, build on later. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, one direction that testers can help in towards uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence is approaching them from the um, ethical standpoint. Is this, is this algorithm actually benefiting people? Uh, and I'm yeah. going to reference a book that if people are interested in learning about the ethics of machine learning and algorithms, yeah. it's a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's about how algorithms, uh, because they're built by us, they have our own biases built into them. It's not like an AI is pure and somehow unbiased, unlike humans are. Uh, and I, this is a, it's got quite a few examples of how uh, things like prison sentence time um, have been determined by uh, how long should someone serve in prison and is based on historical data. But if your yep. historical data is based off, uh, off embedded racism, then all of a sudden your, your new fancy AI, which is unbiased, is just as racist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you think um, testers can approach um, the ethics of, of artificial intelligence? Uh, I think uh, from, uh, from AI perspective, uh, the testers, uh, as you said, uh, it's, it, it's all fun and uh, ensuring uh, for the AI can, uh, can help in terms of uh, getting getting to know the test scenarios or the end-to-end -end flow better. Uh, so it can help in that sense and testers can approach it uh, a way to help them instead of uh, instead of learning all the all the jazz. There's a lot to learn in AI. AI is not a probably a three months course you can learn and get get ahead with. Yeah. But I think uh, to to have sick to ensure that we uh, generate intelligent test cases, how do we do it? And, and that's and that's one thing which I would recommend uh, people to uh, like read read on. And a lot of open source uh, uh, open source AI uh, available, so they can have a look. And and it's it's pretty useful as well. I've tried one of them, and it's pretty useful. Cool. Um, I think we're having some uh, connection difficulties, um, at least 
from my view, it looks like there's been some connection disruptions. So I apologize for anyone who's watching this uh, post recording on YouTube or who is watching it live that, um, uh, but it seems like the connection problems seem to be fixed. I, I hope we were getting clear audio through that segment, but I think we just lost a little bit of video. Um, so I guess with, with that, do you have any final notes um, or, or advice to give to anyone who's watching this this video? I think, yeah, I think uh, one one suggestion or advice uh, I can give to testers is, uh, is you need to uh, ensure that you need to upskill yourself as you go, as you go. And it, it cannot be, it can be in the form of training, it can be in the form of your job that you do, but stay ahead in terms of uh, uh, learning. It, learn, uh, even if you are, uh, doing manual testing, even if you're doing automation, doesn't matter. Um, the learning should not stop. That's the message I want to give to people. Mm, yeah, yeah. Maintaining that learning mindset can be quite challenging, especially if you have a yeah. whole bunch of other things that are competing for your for your attention. Yeah. But at least, um, and you don't have to be an expert in everything. Uh, you can't. You physically can't be uh, an you expert can't. in everything. Uh, so uh, also trying to focus the the skills and tech that you want to improve or highlight as a uh, specialization or your expertise as well. So you can't be yeah. an expert in mobile automation, in web automation, in API automation and CI, even if the job spec says we actually want someone to do all of those things. Uh, those types of people don't exist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one, uh, one thing which I've observed is it, uh, like the profiles nowadays are mentioning everything. They need everything. They need web, API, everything. Yeah. CI, CD, a DevOps knowledge. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, and I feel like that's that's just because someone's given a, a recruiter a wish list of everything they want someone yeah. to do. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, like yeah. a recruiter doesn't know the difference between all of these terms, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and don't realize that that's like a unicorn tester. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unicorn tester. That's true. That's that's a nice term, <laughs> but it does not exist, as you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. I anyway, think, uh, yeah. Thank you for for joining in on the on the interview today. I think we're 